Let me ask this because one of the suggestions was that people would still that it would be grandfathered and people would still be able to have one negatively geared property. Why should Australians be able to negatively gear more than one property? Well, the issue is what there's two reasons. First of all, um, that is something that they plan for. It's something that's a part of the Tax Act. It gives them the capacity to invest back in our nation, in a nation in the most formative way, in a way that actually creates housing, just like farmers create food for you to eat and uh, fibre for you to wear. It's a very noble op occupation. Making sure that there's a housing stock for people to live in is also not a bad outcome. The next thing, of course, Andrew, is that if we remove it, were, were these houses just going to disappear, are they? are they? Or are they going to start falling out of the sky magically? Well, well, neither of those things are going to happen. You're going to have a group of houses that are just sold to somebody else. And with the changes in investment rule, rules to encourage foreign corporations into the housing market, you would see, you'd say that the, the rhyme and reason of the Labor Party policy now would be that foreign corporations would come in and own the houses. I mean, the issue of the house... What about first time owners? ...by demand. What about first well, home owners? The, what we have... Well, first homeowners are not going to be really availed by a whole heap of corporations. Instead of them bidding against another person, a, a policeman or a nurse, they're going to be bidding against the ABC Corporation of Shanghai or of New York. Uh, I'd give them more chance against the registered nurse, quite frankly. All, I think all right. would be a better, better opportunity for them. Let me move to the Middle East. Penny Wong's calling for an immediate ceasefire. The US President's calling for an immediate ceasefire. What's your view? Well, my view is that Hezbollah is in breach of um, United Nations Declaration 1701. They're not supposed to be occupying uh, southern Lebanon. They're certainly not supposed to be firing rockets in. My observation is that this correlates precisely to Hamas's invasion of Israel in, in October, October the 8th. Uh, what we are, we are noting is that they're actually supposed to be peacekeepers in southern Lebanon. They're supposed to be keeping the peace. That's not been happening. Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel is a democracy. Israel has Islamic members of parliament, has Arab members of parliament. Hezbollah's goal, its, its, its reason to exist, its MO, is to remove Israel from the map. Same with Hamas, to remove it from the map. And if we had someone next door to us who wanted to remove Australia from the map and invaded us, I imagine the Australian people would say, I want this issue dealt with, dealt with completely and uh, completely put it to an end so that we can live peacefully. I, I don't believe that Israel wants to own Lebanon um, and I think that I Israelis, like most people in Beirut, just want peace. But you can't get peace if you've got a terrorist organisation that takes it as their, their main issue to remove the country to its south from the map. And, uh, and so you, what you're seeing is what you get. Now, um, Nasrallah is, uh, we believe, or that has been confirmed that he's dead. Uh, maybe with new leadership within Hezbollah, that we start to get some sanity and uh, they actually talk in a constructive way about how we, they can bring this brutal and horrendous uh, infliction on human life to a conclusion. Peter Dutton seems unequivocal that Israel's totally in the right when it comes to this conflict and you made similar noises there. The government less so. We don't often have this sort of division on foreign policy. What do you make of it? Um, I, I believe that there is a sense within the Labor government of political pressure and certain uh, demographics that they see, that they see as pressure upon them, whether it actually eventuates as something else. I think that uh, Peter Dutton is being unequivocal because what you do is you just flip it over and say, if this happened to us, what would we, we want other countries to say about us? You know, would we want equivocation? Would we want to say, well, you know, I suppose you just have to give up a section of Australia and everything will be fine from that point forward. Uh, no, you'd say, no, I want unequivocal support, if not so much for the country, but for the principle. The principle is people have to remember Hamas is a terrorist organisation. Hezbollah is a terrorist organisation. Hamas is a terrorist organisation, invaded Liz, uh, Israel and killed, murdered, raped um, men, women and children. Now, that in, that brought about a war. That's what happens when you do things like that. It brings upon a war. At the do same you, time, Hezbollah is firing rockets. Do you, into, do you believe in a two-state? Do you believe war. in a two-state solution? I think I think we all do. I think we I think what we we need is peace, and we need it, we need it to come to that outcome peacefully. It's the only way an outcome like, like that would happen. It comes to it peacefully. 
is negotiated between rational, calm and moderate people, and we don't have that at the moment. We don't have that in terrorist organisations, but I'm sure in that, when that opportunity arises, uh, just like with the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, we will hopefully get peace. That's what everybody wants. That's unequivocal across all parties. We want peace. We want to see this carnage stop. All, all right. Let's talk about electric vehicles in China. The Energy Minister, Chris Bowen, said last week he wouldn't put in place the same sort of ban on Chinese-made electrical vehicles as the US is. The US are obviously concerned the cars could be controlled in a war situation. It really sounds like something from a Hollywood movie. What do you make of the government's initial reaction to this? Uh, well, Chris Bowen, um, if there was a book written about uh, catastrophic policies and the ministers that preside over them, Chris Bowen would be on the cover, wouldn't he? I mean, everything this, this gentleman's touched has been a complete and utter debacle. And his most recent one is the intermittent power, euphemistically called um, not renewables, they're actually swindle factories. What they're doing to the price of power, what they're doing to our countryside, what they're doing to the seascape, a complete fiasco. And now he's you know, b b boldly stated that he knows more about uh, issues pertinent to electric vehicles than the United States of America does, which I think is, is right up there with his uh, holding the Gen Cost and AEMA reports. Even China, even China is talks about planning that taking their electric vehicles out from basements and out from underneath hotels and putting them in wide open spaces. That's a, that's a pretty good recommendation. But on a more serious yes. note, after the pager issue, the pager um, basically blowing up on around uh, terrorists in southern Lebanon, the, the penny dropped for so many people that there is a capacity remotely to create um, massive pain, massive hurt, uh, hurt uh, maybe at the least, to create complete um, a, breakdown, a breakdown and chaos. Uh, and people have got to start asking the questions, like if you can update the software, if you can track these vehicles, if they're made in China, if there was a malevolent purpose behind it from a totalitarian state, what could, might be the consequences of that? Also, I might add, Andrew, there are 200,000 solar heaters, Chinese-made solar heaters, sitting on roofs around Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and the rest of the countryside. And we've had people who are expert in that field saying, you should have a closer look at exactly what you've done there. And um, this is, these are the issues. If there was, a, God forbid, there was ever a war, but if it was, it would start um, basically online uh, and in space. And uh, within those two things, you can create complete and utter chaos. Just on that, as a can, can I just pick you up on that? You want to do. Are you suggesting we should ban Chinese-made solar heaters? Is that something that that you I, think should occur? I think that it's been noted. It's been noted. It's been noted within your stables, uh, Andrew, that we have to make sure that we're a lot more diligent in oversight of exactly what is stuck on your roof. That, 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 that has been in the Australian, it's uh, written up. Uh, and of course, when you read it, you think, well, especially after the pager and the walkie-talkie issue uh, in, with Hezbollah and what the, the Israelis were able to do, you think if the Israelis were able to do it, would another, would another yeah. country with a malevolent purpose be able to do it to Australia? And just on that, during your time in government, did you ever hear about any sort of scenario like this with the pages or the electric vehicles in security discussions? Were, were experts suggesting to you this sort of thing could occur? Well, the problem with that, Andrew, is as, uh, as former deputy chair of the National Security Committee, um, I could be in line for about 15 years in jail. So if I did know that, I don't think I'd be putting it on national television. OK, let's move to the nuclear debate. Why, why can't we know about the cost of this policy now? Uh, I, I think that it, it's, on, uh, it's on the alternative Prime Minister Peter Dutton's timing. Uh, I, he's a very competent and diligent person. I wouldn't think for one second if he's playing some game that he doesn't have it. Of course they do. And let's just look at the costing of the intermittent power sector. Uh, the swindle factories. We had the Arana West at $650 million. That's turned into $5.4 billion. We had the Burdekin scheme, which was going to be, I think, $12 billion. We have Snowy Hydro 2.0, and I know our sticky fingers are on that one as well. I acknowledge that. But that started at $2 billion, and now it's looking like heading to $20 billion. And the AMO report, and the, or the GenCost report, talks about the cost not to the end user, it talks about the cost to the investor. And the GenCost report, not the 2023 simulation report, does not take into account 
firming or bat you know, battery backup, uh, pump hydro, transmission lines, which the taxpayer is, buying, is going to spend, <laughs> build another 28,000... You can't make this shit up. 28,000 kilometres of it. And, um, of course, that's going to end up in your power bill. So, and the other reports throughout the world say that intermittent power is the dearest, yet Australia is trying to run itself on windmills. I mean, it's just in All right. insane. But, but, but you're, you know, you're talking insane about seven, on the lights go out. You're talking about seven federal government owned power plants, never really been done before. And what of AGL, who has a couple of these sites? Yeah, hang on, hang on. Suggesting yeah, last yes, week. Yes, but, it has been done. What are you going to tell me, Snowy Hydro? Or, so yes, that, yes, it has. Yes, it has. Yes, it has been done before. Snowy, Snowy Hydro was done. Uh, under uh, under powers under Commonwealth powers under heads of government constitutional powers and remember the state governments initially owned all the coal fired power stations. Yes, I mean, that that's was, true, that but that's state, not power. federal. I mean, is, that's that my was a point. Big let let we me made. move on. Let me move on though. AGL, yes. they want to develop renewable energy on their two sites instead. They don't want nuclear power. So isn't that a bit of a spoke in the wheel? No, not really. And and you look at. Look, I, that's one thing I have done in the past and I can talk about is, remember, dealing with people such as Andrew Vesey from AGL. You, these are ruthless organisations that would be quite happy cornering a monopoly section of the market so that you can only buy their product at their price and their product is intermittent power and you'll buy it at their price. I, if I was back as an accountant, Andrew, as a cost accountant, I'd be all for that. Here, yeah, let's create a monopoly. That's what we always try to do as accountants because that's how we make a bucket load of money out of you. Now, um, I believe that one of the big mistakes the coalition at a state level made in the past was the sale in New South Wales of their power infrastructure. I make no qualms about that. We are now looking at looking after a, a raring, I think, $250 million. They sold it for 50 So you can see where this, this debacle ends up. And if, if someone said that they believe that Australia can run on intermittent power, 80, was 82% by 2030 or some other lunacy, um, well, just find me the other country, uh, an effective, an effective right. manufacturing country, an effective Western country that does it. And, of course, they don't because he can't. I'm nearly out of time here. I just want to get uh, ask a couple more questions. Your leader flagged a possible beer excise reduction policy and the, the Liberals then said it wasn't coalition policy. Is there a bit, bit of tension here? What do you think about reducing beer tax? Uh, well, I think that as you go towards budget, you should be investigating or proposal, I, I concur with David that if you keep on putting up the excise on beer, um, that's not he helping anybody. Um, it's just like what we did with cigarettes. You put up the excise, you just create a black market for cigarettes. We've successfully done that. And I, I, that doesn't help Treasury. It doesn't help the kids who buy them. It doesn't help them being in touch with uh, drug dealers. I'm not suggesting that's what's going to happen with beer and spirits, but um, there, there has to be a limit somewhere where you say, if you believe in hotels... If you believe in people's capacity to recreate in a park or to buy a slab of beer and go watch the football, or watch the grand final as I did yesterday and watch the uh, poor old swans get smashed, um, then you've got to have it at a price they can afford it. It's, you just can't, you can't say uh, drinking's bad and then want people to drink to make money for the treasurer. Yes. All right. Well, what do, what sense, do, but what let's do, get closer. Let's get closer to an election and, and go through it. What do you think of the job that David Littleproud's doing at the moment? I think the, the, the David and the Nationals are, are doing a very, very good job. And I look at the work role that David's doing and I look at what we're doing that, but, and also expanding that. If we look at the role of uh, Senator uh, Jacinta Napa, Jim Price and The Voice, incredible. It's changed Australia. The work that David Gillespie's done in nuclear and in, 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 in being the brains trust behind that, I incredible. In the past, people such as Lou O'Brien had a little bit to do with myself, bring forward the Royal Commission into, you know, supporting that into, you know, veteran suicide. Incredible. Uh, you know, in the past, the dams, sealing the third road across Australia. Uh, these are incredible. Things. Even country of origin labelling, where you pick up a good at a supermarket, and there it is, how much of it comes from Australia. Uh, absolutely incredible. And, and the nationals will continue to do that. They'll do it long after I'm gone, long after David's gone, and, and for the betterment of Australia, and, and that's what I hope. We, this has worked so well for our nation having a coalition, and it's incredibly important that we continue on that. And one of the greatest flaws and one of the biggest reasons the Labor Party are going to struggle so badly at the next election is they don't have a proper regional uh, caucus, regional voice. And if they did, they wouldn't be going on this sort of massive jolly about intermittent power. They would actually be building dams in regional Australia 
that would actually be uh, fixing up the roads in a substantive way in regional Australia, and they're doing none of that. Barnaby Joyce, thanks so much for your time. Always a pleasure.